Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy good, Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We have, I keep saying this every time we, we teach, but we have another great um, lesson. And it's actually, this lesson was for me because it talks about something that I really struggle with that with, and that is patience. <laughs> How we wait in the crucible, this waiting thing. And um, before we get started, though, on the, today's lesson, I'm going to ask David if he'll pray for us. Thank you. We will. <laughs> Loving Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Father in heaven and Holy Spirit, we are coming to you on this Sabbath day so that you can give us the qualities that we need so that you can restore us to you so that we can have that eternal life. This week's lesson is about patience. Lord, you are described as long-suffering, patient. And last week was meekness, Lord. And part of meekness's definition is all about patience, Lord. So help us. So as we learn and study your word, that we can take patience at heart because Jesus showed patience for us till the hour of his last breath. Lord, we ask that everyone who's coming here, that they can come to the Sabbath school safely. Who will be watching, bless them so they can understand your word. I ask you bless Scott, Barbara, and myself so that we can speak words that are from the Holy Spirit and not ours. And we ask you to forgive all our sins and bless us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, the, the um, memory verse is from Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, what, long-suffering. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and like David said in his prayer, we're lear we've learned that hope and meekness are essential tools in overcoming crucibles. And they're both defined by waiting. However, the concept of biblical waiting is not only about waiting, but about waiting with patience. Patience is the ability to wait calmly between the point at which we think something should be done and the point that God desires it to be done. <clears throat> so our thought of when it should be done is not always the same time God thinks it should be done. So this patient is not a political stratagem, but is part of the fruit of the Spirit. God's people wait patiently in the crucible because God himself is patient. And we're gonna, Scott's going to be talking quite a bit about that um, later on in the lesson. God is patient because he is loving in character and because he chooses the best moment to intervene. The best moment is calculated by God to offer as much time as possible for the salvation of as many as possible. So sometimes God's waiting really doesn't have to do with anything that we would think was important, but he is always looking for the salvation of his people. We find that waiting is possible only when we trust the one in whom we are waiting. And so it's only through Christ that this waiting, <clears throat> that, um, that trust, that, that makes it possible. So... Let's look at seven principles of why we wait. Well, first of all, waiting refocuses the mind away from things of this earth and back on God. So waiting, the purpose of this waiting, this patience, is to refocus on God. We can be so obsessed with things, even good things, from God that he needs to direct us back to him. So he, he brings our thoughts back to him. So waiting allows us to have a clearer picture of ourselves. Sometimes we need to understand our own motives only after, after time has gone by. And sometimes <clears throat> we re have to realize that our motives are not about God, but about ourselves. Sometimes God reveals our selfishness to us in, in these waiting times. It builds uh, spiritual stamina. In Western um, culture this is difficult the culture we live in because we want everything now 
I want it, and I want it now. And we see that from, from babies. Little babies reach out, gimme, gimme, gimme. And you watch them fight over toys, I want it now. And so we struggle with waiting. Uh, waiting in lines, I hate waiting in lines. Waiting in traffic. Does any of you go crazy waiting in traffic? We, <clears throat> we, we see road rage. <laughs> we, we see road rage in traffic. So this waiting, and, and we each have these places and times where we just hate waiting. Um, standing in line, just standing in line for anything waiting can be difficult. So th waiting also develops our spiritual, th our, uh, spiritual strengths. And we see that in faith and trust. James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Waiting on God allows us to implement other pieces of his plan that he, may needs, that he may need to complete first. So sometimes waiting on, when, when we're waiting on God, he's busy doing other things to bring about the, the solution he wants. And we see that in Galatians 4.4 4, when it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. <clears throat> so Christ didn't come when everyone thought he should come. But he came when God was ready for him to come. And so we see that. And it's, it's the same now where we see that um, we keep waiting. Everybody says, well, nobody knows the time or the hour. And it's been over 150 years and we thought Christ should be here by now. Mm -hmm. But God's plan is, like we, we read earlier, to have as many people saved as can possibly be saved. And so <clears throat> there's certain things that have to line up prophetically in every other way for him to come. The other reason for waiting is he may be testing us. If we don't get <clears throat> an immediate response from God, we may find ourselves turning away and looking somewhere else or wait in order to see if we will really cling to him and to what he has said. And so it could be a test. And then the last reason is we may, we may wait and never know the answer. Mm -hmm. It may be in heaven when, when we, we know the answer. <clears throat> Ellen White had this experience. So she wasn't above this, this waiting with patience yeah. issue. It, uh, in Selected Messages, uh, book two, it says she struggled. Um, so she said, many nights during the past nine months, I was, in a I was unable to sleep but two hours. And then at times darkness would gather about me, but I prayed and realized much sweet comfort in drawing nigh to God. I cannot read the purpose of God in my affliction, but he knows what is best, and I will commit my soul, body, and spirit to him as to a faithful creator. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed unto him against that day. If we educate and <clears throat> train our souls to have more faith, more love, greater patience, and more perfect trust in the Heavenly Father, I know we would have more peace and happiness day by day as we pass through the conflicts of life. And so as we look at patience, um, we see uh, how God has patience. And I'm going to leave most of that for um, Scott to talk about. But there are a number of scriptures where we see God is long-suffering. He abounds in mercy. He's gracious. He's compassionate. And, um, and he's the author of wondrous deeds. And at the same time, he by no means clears the guilty. The Lord is long-suffering, abundant in mercy. We see that in Numbers 14.8. 1418, long suffering, abundance in mercy, forgiving in iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children unto the third and fourth generation. And so we see that um, 
that God is patient, but in that patience, we don't need to be confused, we don't need to be indifferent or powerless because he is in control. So just as God has patience for us, we need to have patience for him, with him and with one another. And Scott, you're going to talk more about patience. Patience, yes. Um, I think in medicine you have to have lots of patience. Yeah. Uh, pun intended. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to talk about the God of patience today. So um, in our society, we've learned that everything needs to be done fast. So McDonald's offers fast food. Cox offers fast internet. Uh, Amazon offers fast delivery of your goods. Um, Tesla offers fast cars and fast charging. Um, <laughs> and then God says to us, um, Slow down. Be still and know that I am God. Yeah. So being still seems the opposite of what the world teaches us, like always be on the move, always be looking for the next deal, always be uh, doing something. But God is just asking us to, to be still. And so uh, in looking at today's lesson, uh, I'm going to read here from Romans 15, 4 and 5. For whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Um, and so now the lesson says, uh, we are normally impatient about things that we really want to have or have been promised but don't yet have. And I think I can attest to the kids especially doing that. If you promise them something, they, they're not going to be very patient. So they, if they said, did you get me this thing or the other thing? Did you do it? Did you do it? And they, they certainly insist on it immediately. Um, and because we rarely get what we want when we want it, it means that we are often doomed to irritation and impatience. And when this is the case, it is almost impossible to maintain peace and trust in God. Waiting is painful by definition. In Hebrew, one of the words, wait patiently, comes from a Hebrew word that could be translated to be much pained or to shake or tremble or to be wounded, to be sorrowful. And certainly, I think waiting feels that way to me. Um, we don't really like waiting for anything. So now let's read from Psalms 37, 7 to 11. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any way to do evil, for evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. For a, yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be, yea, Thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in an abundance of peace. And then Psalms 27:14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And now I was going to... Um, go through some Bible examples of sort of three conditions. There's impatient people who never improved, and there's examples of perfect patience, and then there's people who are impatient who became patient, which I think is where we need to be, probably the third example. So um, here, here's some examples. So Saul didn't wait the full seven days in order to sacrifice to God. So when Samuel didn't come, he waited till the seventh day, but didn't wait till the end of the day. And then he started offering a sacrifice on his own, which God had not commanded him to do. So therefore, 
God was upset with him and it resu resulted in him being rejected as king of Israel. Esau did not wait to obtain some food from his father's house. Instead, he sold his birthright to his brother for a bowl of food, of soup. Um, this led to the loss of his spiritual birthright and ultimately the loss of his salvation. Judas was impatient as well. He did not want to let Christ become king at his own time, but he thought he would use human methods to bring about his coronation. Uh, on the other hand, we have some good examples of people who were very patient in the Bible. So Noah was patient as he preached about the coming flood for over 120 years, and he built a boat during uh, that long time period. And he had to endure lots of ridicule from his friends and family, but he was rewarded as being the only family surviving from the entire world, worldwide flood. Um, Job was also patient under severe trials, and he was rewarded by doubling his way, wealth. Um, Jesus was also tempted to take matters in his own hand when things didn't go his way, um, to avenge himself against humans that were controlled by Satan. But he was rewarded by bringing many sons unto glory and being crowned Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And then there's also some examples in the Bible of people who were impatient at first and then became patient. So Jacob was impatient to get the birthright, so he tried to secure it by fraud. And this cost him 20 years of exile from his father's house, um, during which time he had to learn patience. And his mother, who had given him the bad advice of uh, trying to deceive his father, ended up, he ended up never seeing her again. Nevertheless, he was able to overcome uh, and is now considered the father of the faithful, both physical and spiritual Israel. Uh, Moses was also impatient at first when God didn't bid him to do so. He killed this Egyptian, and this cost him 40 years worth of exile, uh, during which time he learned patience by tending sheep. Uh, John, the apostle slash revelator, was also known as one of the sons of thunder, and he was impatient when the Samaritans didn't want to allow Jesus to uh, spend the night there. So he's like, let's call fire down from heaven. Uh, and Jesus was much pained by seeing his uh, sort of rash lack of um, patience. And so, but ultimately he became very patient and then Jesus revealed him the book of Revelation and he rewarded him as being one of the ones on one of the thrones to judge Israel. So, um, in Romans 5, 3 through 5, it says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not... Uh, ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. God knows our problems and trials and we need uh, not to try and take the fulfillment of his plans into our own hands. We need to allow him time to solve the issues in his way. And as Roman 5 states, we go through these trials that we may develop patience, and patience will lead to hope, and hope will lead us to be unafraid of anything man can do to us because our lives are hid within Christ. Thank you. Move on to the next day. All right, <laughs> David. You're going to talk to us about God's timing. Yeah, waiting in the crucible. Waiting. is, is waiting. Uh, Monday. I know all of you are waiting to have us finish the Sabbath school. But please have patience, because God wants us to have patience. And here's the thing. You know why this is important? Because we have a choice. God gave us choice. See, in Joshua 24, 15, Joshua says, Choose for yourself on this day whom will you serve as for me and my people, we will serve the Lord. So waiting in the crucible is for the impatient people. 
And the fact of the matter is, because we have a choice, we want to make a choice on our own. And it says, those who wait in the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagle. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So waiting in the crucible is, for all of us, it's the impatient nature of us that Jesus is trying to change and make us like him. See, God is in control. He's holding the whole earth on his hand. And he has a bird's eye view of everything on this planet, what's going on. We have little perspective here and there. When God looks at it and looks at the whole world, the whole crucible, because our earth is a crucible, it's for the imperfect people to be perfect. Jesus came for the sick. So he knows where, who belongs, and how much he can help each one of us so we can all be saved. So God is in control of time, and because he's in control of time, anyone who's in control of their time is really in control of everything. Right, Scott? And that is why God is in control of everything. You see what happened in Adam, for Adam and Eve? They were placed in the crucible in Eden. And in Eden, God said, wait on the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan says, why wait on God? Just take the knowledge of good and evil from me. And they chose and did not wait in their training. Out, <laughs> <laughs> and since we are all the same, right? And so the Sabbath school lesson gives us six reasons why God, you know, set up this crucible, this earth. And for Adam and Eve, it was Eden. Why he set it up. And I really like them. So the first one is the crucible helps us rely on God. And Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And Psalms 31.5 says, My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies. You see, um, the crucible on this earth is the focus is not on us. The focus is on God. We, and that when we realize that, then whatever we do, we wait on God to act. Okay, rely on God so he can send us to do his purpose. Um, Isaiah 6, 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, Lord, send me. See, that's when we rely on God to do his purpose. The second one, Barbara mentioned it very nicely. It helps me to have a clear picture of myself. What is the underlying motive of me on this planet? Am I doing good works for credit? Or am I doing good works because I love people to be saved? I want to represent God. So, um, Psalms 139, 23, 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And Micah 6, 8, I always bring this up because this is the path of salvation. God said, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. So here's the thing clear picture we have no righteousness where all of our righteousness are filthy rags so what is to justly to do justly mean when jesus asked the rich ruler what must i do to have eternal life he said to sell everything and give it to the poor and follow me the question is am i repentant enough to come to god and be his servant so it tells me what my motives are is it based on scoring points or is it based on the fact that I truly am not worthy of anything let God work on me that's one of the purpose of crucible it also makes me persistent Matthew 7 7 says ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be open to you also Luke eleven thirteen 13 says if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much your heavenly father would give the Holy Spirit to those who ask you see in, in the crucible, we are to continuously ask God. We had, what? 
we need to ask the Holy Spirit because that's where everything works. Holy Spirit is the one that does the work. And Romans 5, 3 to 5 says it perfectly. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, which is patience and perseverance, character, character, hope. But now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who he has given us. So in the crucible, we learn God, uh, to ask God continuously to give us the Holy Spirit. In the crucible, our faith and trust are developed. The Sabbath school lesson says, that waiting helps to develop spiritual strengths like faith and trust. It is the key that opens the door to understanding many spiritual things. And um, you see, in James 1, 2 to 4, it says, um, Perseverance must finish its work so that you may mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, with faith and trust in God, guess what, Barbara? We lack nothing. It's not the billionaire's money. It's not our job. It's not our children. You know, though the, everything in this world will strangely go dim. Mm -hmm. But what will not go dim is our faith and trust in God. And when we have that, we have everything. So this crucible teaches us that. And then the other one, the other reason for being in the crucible is because God has, in the crucible, God has time to make everything work together. Like I said, he's holding this. On his hand, the whole earth, the crucible, and he knows where the puzzles are and he can work things together. And it says, um, waiting allows God to implement his pieces. In Galatians 4, 4, it says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son. You see, God to God, time is life, right? For our problem is to us, time is me, but God is, time is life. Just like, um, therefore, um, God's time is designated to save lives, even till the end. So if we love God, we will rejoice in God's time. We'll rejoice in the crucible so that many more people can be saved. The, and then uh, the next one, the last one, it says, it, it helps me to live by faith. Barbara said, Mrs. Ellen White said, you know, sometimes we don't know why God does things. So he wants us to live by faith. And that is the key. The fact that we are born is the reason for God's purpose is to restore us. See, we are predestined to be restored, to be saved, because we are born here, born in this crucible. This is where we're learning to be the children of God. So don't ever give up faith because our God is the restorer of all things. You see, Abraham, even though he waited 25 years to get Isaac, in the process, he made mistakes, but guess what? With his faith in God, God restored him. God is here to restore us in the crucible. Crucible is where the restoration takes place. You see, crucible is not for perfect people. It is for us, imperfect people. Jesus came here for us. What's uh, the most interesting thing that I learned is that Hosea 6, 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. God knew in Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve would fail, but the issue is not, issue is not the fall, failing of Adam and Eve. The issue is that God would restore everything in due time. It is his long suffering that led to the fullness of meekness of Jesus. The, the patience, you see meekness is enduring pain and suffering with patience and without resentment. So, because this crucible is perfect for all of us imperfect people, we really need to cheer each other up in this crucible so that we can wait with e each other. You know why? Because Jesus is in the crucible today, waiting and suffering with you. Isn't that amazing? Thank you. All right. We're going to spend some time with King David. Remember last week, we, he was one of our examples that we used. We're going to dig a little deeper this this week uh, David we talked about David's meekness but now we get to talk about the whole David's patience and how how long he had to wait to become king and so uh, we see that David um, was anointed by Samuel as king however it was a very long journey 
probably more than 10 years for him to be able to take the throne in Jerusalem. And so there's no doubt in my mind that there were many times, and we see it throughout his life, that he was felt that he was in the midst of a crucible. So we start out with Samuel 16, and we see that Samuel was very sad. He was grieving because um, King Saul, who wasn't what they had hoped, what, what, wasn't what he had hoped for. And we'll start in 1 Samuel 16, 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king from among his sons. And so Samuel goes, and, and we see that he was hesitant about going. He was afraid that he would be killed if... if if anybody realized that he was going to be anointing another king, yeah. put him in a, in a difficult place. But well, given what Saul did to the priest later, I think there was a justifiable fear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Saul did what the Lord asked, and he went to Bethlehem. And the elders um, were pretty nervous when they saw him coming. So we pick up in verse 6. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab, which was... Um, one of Jesse's son, and said, surely this is the one that, that the Lord has anointed before him. And God says something really interesting here. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look upon his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see man as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And so Samuel goes through the rest of the sons, and it's like, oh, <laughs> none of these God is telling me are the ones. So he said, asked Jesse if there is another one. So he sent, in, sent and brought him in. He was ready with bright eyes and good-looking, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the oil and anointed him. So we see that, that this young man, David, was anointed at a very young age to be king. And I, I, I thought about, you know, God talks about David as being a man after his own heart. And I, I, I think part of that, I've, I've, I've thought about different reasons for why that is, but I, as I'm studying this lesson, I'm thinking one of the reasons is God is teaching and taught David patience. Because if, if a king is going to rule wisely, he has, to, he has to rule with patience. So anyway, as we move on, we see that David's first uh, uh, encounter with Saul was to play music for, for Saul's troubled spirit. And that was when he threw a javelin at him. Later, he becomes Israel's hero and kills Goliath. And remember, they used to chant, about how many more people David had killed than Saul had killed. And so Saul was jealous of the, 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 the great warrior that David was. And all, it, David keeps up, keeps, he, he ends up running for his life several times. So, and it's interesting because we see that Saul knew that David was going to be king. It wasn't, it wasn't just that that um that david knew and david's family knew but both saul and jonathan knew that too so we see in first samuel 23 17 and he said to him do not fear for the hand of saul my father shall not find you you shall be king over israel and i shall be next to you even my father saul knows that so this is a conversation between jonathan and david so they knew that that God had appointed David to be king. And we see Saul talking about it here in Samuel, 1 Samuel 24, 20, where he says, And I know indeed that you will, shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. But we see that even though everyone knew this, David didn't do anything to push his destiny in advance of God's plan. And, in fact, he appears to do the opposite. And we see that in 1 Samuel 24, 5 
uh, 24, uh, 5 through 7. Now it happened after David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to the men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, for the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul got up and went from the cave and went on his way. And we see again later in Samuel 26, we start at 7, that um, David and Abishah, one of David's um, leaders, one of his captains, came to the people by night, and there saw, was Saul lay sleeping within the camp, with a spear struck the ground by his head, and Abner and the people, and, and Abner and, and the people lay all around him. And, and Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hands this day. Now therefore, please let me strike him at once with a spear, right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. So even his, his men are saying, let me, let me get him. <laughs> and David says, don't destroy him, for who can stretch their hand against the Lord? And so we see over and over, and, and again in Samuel uh, 26, 12, and 13, so David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away, and no man saw it or knew it for they were all asleep in a deep sleep uh, from the Lord had fallen upon them. Now David went to the other side and stood on top of the hill in a great distance. And we know the story. David called out to the king. And Saul was like, oh, my sin is greater than yours because you did not, you, you had the opportunity to kill me and you didn't, and yet I wanted you dead. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and you guys can, can go through and read read all the lessons for yourself. But we see that um, David over and over had, had several opportunities to, to put Saul to death, and yet he didn't. But the, the more important thing is, is looking at all of this David's picture and his road to the throne, we could probably wrap it up in sh one short sentence here. It says, don't grab what God has not given. And so David understood this patiently waiting, waiting and not grabbing what God had given. So it, it, sometimes it might mean for us to be waiting a very long time. And we see like some sprouts grow up literally within hours and others take many years like trees um, to grow. But then when they're strong and the wind comes that they are not uprooted and, and, and they're, held, they're held strong. The Bible commentary says the Lord does not always choose for his workmen the greatest of those of greatest talents, but he selects those whom he can best use. Individuals who might do good service for God may for a time be left in obscurity, apparently unnoticed and unemployed by their master. But if they faithfully perform their duties and their humble position, cherishing the willingness to labor and to sacrifice for him, he will, in his own time, entrust them with greater responsibilities. So be, hum, be before honor is humility. The Lord can use the most effectually those who are most sensible in their own unworthiness and inefficiency. He will teach them to exercise the courage of faith. He will make them strong in uniting their weakness with his might, wise by connecting their ignorance to his wisdom. And so we see that Christ wants us to wait on him because we want him and, and we want to wait on him even though it's difficult sometimes because after all isn't it his plan that we want to have fulfilled so this 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 was a this was a good David was a good object lesson you know, I think, Barbara, for this I wanted to mention an interesting thing if it, because of David's respect for Saul mm -hmm. who was a Benjaminite right Scott in the end is Judah was David, the uh, tribe of Judah and Benjamin mm -hmm. together became Jews. They stayed together and the other 10 tribes were Samaritans or Israelites yeah. because of David's respect for Saul. Yeah. Incredible. It, it, that, that's you know, really I never thought of that, David. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Because of this, that he, he, this happened. Thank you. Very <clears throat> interesting. Yeah. Okay, Scott. Oh, you get Elijah. Ooh. Elijah. 
Poor Elijah. The, the problem of rushing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I guess to, to me, I would have thought that Elijah had been fairly patient, but I think when it came to one critical moment, he, he faltered a little bit, uh, and, and you could see why. So, the showdown on the top of Mount Carmel had ended. Fire had come uh, out of heaven, and all the people had acknowledged the true God, and the false prophets had been put to death. God had been vindicated. You would have thought that Elijah had been growing in spiritual strength as the day went on, but suddenly he heard something that terrified him so much that he wanted to die. Uh, read the rest of the story in 1 Kings 19, 1-9. Well, you know, you know you have, if you think about this, this was a huge, this was a huge win for God this day. I mean, the, 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 prof, the prophets of Baal were, they were, they'd worked themselves up to a frenzy, screaming and cutting themselves. And then all of a sudden, here comes God, and Elijah just prays and everything. The fires, the, even though they put water over and over and over the, the, the sacrifice, so you wouldn't think it would even be able to light fire. God just pours fire down from heaven. So it was a huge, huge uh, really high time. Then they, then they ran off and killed all the prophets. Of Baal. Of Baal. And so now... Um, so now... When, when, uh, well, let, let's read here what happens in 1 Kings 19, 1-9. And Ahab told Jezebel um, all that Elijah had done. And withal, he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And now, just a little parenthetical interest. Uh, I'm going to just remember what she did to Naboth, because Elijah had been the one to confront Ahab about the issue with... So Naboth had this vineyard that... Um, was coveted by King Ahab. And so Jezebel's like, why, why are you sad, Ahab? I, I can take care of this. So he set up some uh, false witnesses so that he would be stoned for blaspheming God, which was a complete lie. Um, but anyway, I think that could have some interesting typology in there as well. Uh, and I, this is another one of my thoughts, is that perhaps God would have destroyed Jezebel there and then had she tried to... Um, destroy Elijah. So I, I, I firmly believe that might have happened. So, But he went, uh, and he, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and he came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. As he lay, he slept under a juniper tree. Behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink uh, and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. <coughs> and he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat for forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave, lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? Meaning, why did you flee from Jezebel? So, um, I guess that's my thought, that perhaps God would have had some miraculous deliverance uh, or destroyed Jezebel there, because I think she, she ended up being uh, thrown out of a city and eaten by a city wall and eaten by dogs. But I think that her death might have been hastened had Elijah not run away. So... Um, the, the lesson says, basically, what lessons can we learn from 
this bad example that Elijah set of running away. And I think uh, I can relate to Elijah that I think when things get too, uh, too difficult, sometimes I, uh, I, I would have the same tendency to flee away from somebody who I think might want to kill me. So I think that fleeing is like a natural human reaction. So we would be called upon to overcome that fear. And then uh, here's some other examples of um, people in the Bible who did not have the patience that they should have. So um, here it talks also about Abraham, which says, um, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my handmaid, that I may obtain a child by her. And Abram hearkened unto the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. So that, and we know how that turned out, which was not all that good. I created many problems, not just for them, but for after generations. Um, and then it talks about the impatience of Moses and Aaron when after 40 years of wandering in the desert, the sons were appearing to be just as unfaithful uh, as their fathers had been 40 years before. So Moses and Aaron lost their cool and Moses like said, must we fetch uh, water out of, here you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod and smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron, said, Because you have not believed me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So that was kind of a severe um, punishment for Moses and Aaron after having been le leading the people of Israel who had been such a rebellious and stiff-necked people as they were called in the Bible. Uh, but yet they led them for 40 years in the desert and now they weren't going to get to go to the promised land. Then another example here was given uh, that of Samson. Um, I think we know his story, but basically he was impatient and took a, wa a wife of the Philistines uh, which ended up not being after God's will. Um, and then we already talked about uh, John, the son of Zebedee, um, and their mother asking that, they, that Jesus grant one to sit on the right and one on the left hand. So she was essentially trying to jump ahead of the plan. Um, let's see. And then the last example was about Saul. And in Acts uh, 9, verse 1, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Um, and let's see. So the problem with rushing is that essentially it ends up taking us further away from our goal. Whereas with God, he, he takes you to the most direct way to fulfill <clears throat> to fulfill his goal um, and so there's a patience is a key characteristic also of the end time remnant of God here is the patience of the saints and here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus uh, and then revelation I mean in Proverbs 1429 it says that impatience is folly he who is slow to wrath and is of great understanding, uh, he who is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he of, that is of hasty spirit exalteth folly. And Proverbs 16, 32, that says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit uh, than he who taketh a city. And now I'm going to end with one quote, but it's fairly short. <clears throat> so from Testimonies to the Church, it says, Remember that prayer is the source of your strength. A worker <clears throat> cannot gain success while he hurries through his prayers and rushes away to look after something that he fears may be neglected or forgotten. 
He gives only a few hurried thoughts to God. He does not take his time to think, to pray, to wait upon the Lord for a renewal of his physical, spiritual and physical strength. He will soon become wary. He does not feel the uplifting, inspiring influence of God's Spirit. He is not quickened by fresh life. His jaded frame and tired brain are not soothed by the personal contact with Christ. There are those who work all day, far into the night, to do what seems must be done. The Lord looks pityingly upon the weary, heavy-laden burden bearers and says, Come unto me, I will give you rest. All right, thank you. You know, it's, it's, that, that whole thing is interesting because when I think about Revelation, the patience of the saints, we, as, as you study prophecy, you see the that those who are martyred going, how long, O oh Lord? Mm -hmm. How much longer, Lord? How much longer? And, and sometimes we feel that way. How much longer, Lord? But uh, his coming is soon. And that patience, the keeping his commandments, doing his work, is what makes those who make it saints. Yeah, you know, and God says, have patience because the number has not been completed. Mm -hmm. So patience, God's time is life. Time to have enough life saved. Very good. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Scott. So Thank Thursday's you. lesson is take delight in the Lord always. This is a great lesson also because it starts with um, Psalms 37 from 1 to 8, but I will not read it. Uh, you can read it, but what the points here I like to mention. It says, do not exasperate. That means do not continuously worry. It says, trust in God. Delight yourself in him, verse 4. Verse 5 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring you to pass, which is um, verse 5. And then verse 7 says, Be quiet, rest in the crucible. Think about resting on this earth, Sabbath day, right? Rest in, in the crucible. Be quiet. And that's that. Cease from anger, verse 8 and verse 9. Wait on God. You see, the thing about about uh, learning to wait patiently is what God wants us to focus on is that just not, don't just be there, but be there with delight, with joy, because joy and delight is what's going to sustain us through this process while we go through this earth and, and become, you know, uh, converted to his image and likeness. See, we need to be all be happy that we are born on this earth with this mental health issue and all these things going on in this earth and always looking up to see what other people have, we uh, many times get depressed. But the fact that we are born on this earth, this crucible, because God already predestined us to be saved, we really need to remember that and delight on it every second. And that is very, very important. And since God has taken out from our culture, it is a little bit difficult for most people to grasp that ideology. You see, um, delight in the Lord means don't take charge in the crucible like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Let God take charge. See, in the crucible, we live in a per state of perfect trust. And that is the uh, verse um, uh, Psalms 37 is talking about. And then if you go to Philippians 4, 4 to 8, it will say, rejoice in the Lord always and it also talks about why, because Lord is with us. He's at hand. And we are not to be anxious. Why? Because God brings peace. So how do we live? We live in constant thanksgiving. Live life in this crucible with continuous thanksgiving. Then the next um, slide will tell you that crucible is a place of worship. It's not a place of lamentation. It is very important. Because crucible... That's a really good point. Yeah, it's not a place of, you know, lamentation. Crucible, this being born in this earth, people say, oh, it's such a hard thing and to live in this earth. But then we have to think about it. It is only hard if we live with, without Jesus. But it is as a victory where, for the sinner when we bring Jesus in there. Because you know why? Jesus is already in the crucible right now with every single one of us. So crucible can be defeat. When we worry, when we worry for ourselves, we take charge. See, worship with worry 
delays miracles. That's why Jesus says, when you have a faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains mm -hmm. because you are delighting in God. Uh, and it says, uh, you know, Mrs. Ellen White said that we must not worry about tomorrow. Jesus said that too. Remember that we shouldn't worry about tomorrow. Just worry about today, one day at a time. Praise God one day at a time, right? That's how Jesus did it when he was on this earth. And he wants us to rest in our crucible on Sabbath, right? Or just stay quiet because sometimes the greatest worship is not to complain, but to really stay quiet because we are representing Jesus. And when we complain about our life, guess what? We are saying that, why did you bring us to this crucible, God? We shouldn't have been here. And we don't want that negative thing. You know, Jesus is the greatest fourth star general because he not only is on this earth, he was here. He got wounded. He died. He got the purple heart. And his four stars are actually for all of us, not for himself, because he said he's going to share his throne of crown with us. See, the process of sanctification is in the crucible. And our part in this process is to praise God with thanksgiving all the time. And we cannot shortcut this process. Many times we feel like we shouldn't be here. You know, we have all these problems. Maybe we can shortcut this. But when you look at a rosebud, and you see that the rosebud's full potential is a big rose, right? With beautiful petals and smell. If we shortcut that process and try to open that rosebud, guess what? It's going to break, and there will never be a perfect rose. Crucible is for all of us to become that perfect rose. We need to take delight in every situation because every situation in this earth that we go through is the point of redemption. 2 Corinthians 12.10 says, This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Think about it. Our strength is in our weakness. Strength is in the weakness. Why? Because the crucible is there to make us better, to make us strong, to make us children of God, not children of Satan. And that is why we got to appreciate our life on this earth. No matter where we are born, what background we come from, we have to appreciate it. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things as Christians we need to address and preach and talk to our children about it too. We are so blessed to be born on this earth. This earth is our classroom. And finally, uh, there's two things. You know, as Barbara was talking about David, I was thinking about something so interesting that we not, not a lot of people know about it. But let's go to Shatrok, Meshach, and Abednego's story really quick. Daniel chapter 3, they, uh, verse 17. Uh, Shatrok, Meshach, Abednego tells the king, Nebuchadnezzar, that you know what? We, king, will not bow down to your image. We will not do it. And because they don't do it, he puts them in the furnace. And guess what? He, they do not get burned. But here, Nebuchadnezzar writes a line in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Just like he has a chapter, he also has a line here. And this is based on the delight that Sadrach, Meshach, Abednego took to trust in the Lord and not breaking his commandments when they were about to die. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the Lord, uh, God of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. What did they do? Trust. Perfect trust. They delighted in him. Even though they said, even though God doesn't save us, we will not break his commandment. See, this earth, we need to have that type of trust. We might go through troubles and we might lose our life, but we should not compromise on God. You see, meekness is about patience and about praise. Patience and praise is meekness. But I want to talk about this story in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5 to 13. Here is a man that's related to Saul, the king. And he believes that David is the one that uh, tortured and killed many people of Benjaminite. So let me read. As, and here David is being followed by Absalom because Absalom, his son, wants to kill him and overthrow him. So here David is fleeing. And let me read uh, Shimei, Shimei's story. It's the most incredible story. Thank you. Uh, as King David approached Barhum, a man from the same clan at Saul's family came out from there. His name was Shimei, son of Gera, and he cursed as he came out. He pelted David. That means he threw rocks, stones, and showered him with sand. 
and the all king's officials with stones, the, though um, all the troops and the special guard, guard were on David's right and left. As he cursed, Shammai said, Get out, get out, you murderer, you scoundrel. The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul. In those places you have reigned. The Lord has given the kingdom into, your, uh, into the hands of your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a murderer. Then Abishai, one of the, uh, David's uh, persons, said, Let me go over and cut off his head. But the king said, What does this have to do with you, you son of Zehurah? If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, Curse David. Who can ask, why do you do this? David then said to Abishai and all his officials, My son, my own flesh is trying to kill me. How much more than this Benjaminite? Leave him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be, this is the clincher for all of us. It may be that the Lord will look upon my misery and restore me to his covenant blessing instead of his curse. That's the purpose of this crucible, that when we go through this, God will see how patient we are, how much we rejoice in him, that he will restore us through his covenant blessing and relieve us from his curse. Thank you. Thank you. I want to wrap this up with uh, one short thought from Ellen White. It says, The Lord is not pleased to have us fret or worry ourselves out of the arms of Jesus. More is needed of the quiet waiting and watching combined. We think unless we have feeling that we are not on the right track. And we keep looking within for some sign benefiting the occasion. But the reckoning is not a feeling, but a faith. And we've seen that with every story mm -hmm. that we've discussed from the Bible today on this issue of patience and waiting. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for this beautiful lesson on patience, Lord. As we are here this after today, we we ask that you would be with us as we work to do, grow and develop our patience. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a helping of patience so that, we can under, so that we can quietly and patiently wait on you. And, Lord, that we will not fret, we will not struggle with waiting on your timing because, Father, your timing is always perfect. So, Lord, we want to thank you again for this blessed Sabbath. We thank you that we have had this opportunity to spend time in your word and to look at, at these examples that you have given us of people's lives where they had to, uh, where they have been good with patience and where they've struggled. So Lord, we just pray that we will be successful, that we will be able to say we, are, we have the patience of the saints, that we keep your commandments and we have your faith. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, Happy everyone. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you so much. Have a blessed week.